So um, it really is a pleasure to be here. I mean, apart from now, I'm really enjoying the meeting. I think we've had some terrific science. So again, thanks to the organisers. So I'm going to talk about hypoxia in the uterus, which is something that's interested me for, for many years, as you'll see in the slide. So conventionally, I'm going to give you an introduction. Um, and then rather like Goldilocks, I'm going to talk about hypoxia in three parts, the just right, the too much, and the too little. So, um, and just to warn you now, hypoxia two is the longest part. So don't worry, we are making progress as that goes on and on and on. So to this audience, I really don't need to remind you that the uterus is essential and that it's there to uh, protect and nourish the fetus. But what I'm more interested in pointing out here is what an enormously muscular organ it is. 99% of those cells are myocytes, so it's a smooth muscle, and it has to work really hard. And what it has to do, as you can see here, is contract repetitively, repeatedly for hours to dilate the cervix so that eventually, if all goes well, that cervix is dilated to around 10 centimetres and the fetal head can pass through. So then we have a delivery and... I think this actually sums it up for the mother. I think irrespective of which culture, which period in time, I think any of us who've been there and done that will remember that sort of come on, come on expression. Um, I think the chap here is not so realistic. I think uh, probably that's where we all were, yeah? So, and again, I hope you will thank your mothers for being here and having that uterus. That's enabled that to happen. And I just want to spend one slide just um, debunking some of the things about smooth muscle because people seem to think if you're not striated muscle, you're rather wimpy, it doesn't count. That ain't the case for the myometrium. And actually, this, this tells you the fact that this is hours and hours, the marathon, if you will, of giving birth. So I've just highlighted some features of uterine cells. They are enormous. So at least in the uh, term pregnant, you can almost see these, can't you? They are half a millimetre long and they are wide. You'll also read still in textbooks that smooth muscle doesn't have a well-developed uh, reticulum. Again, that isn't always true by any extent. And what you're looking at there is a single cell, and you're looking at the calcium within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what you can see is how richly endowed that uterine myocyte is with a calcium store. And then finally, we produce in uterine myocytes substantial currents. So it's an inward calcium current you're looking at here. And you can see these are picoamps. These are nanoamps of current. So substantial cells producing substantial currents. So, in a way, yes, you can see these are set up to be highly contractile. And yet, and yet, problems can still arise. And the easiest way to point out what a tissue has to do is give examples of when that doesn't always work properly. And so I have some examples of that. This first statistic is truly shocking and appalling, that in the world at least a third of a million women die. So that's not they're sick or poorly, they die still with complications associated with pregnancy and childbirth. And we can lay around 50% or more of the causes of that due to aberrant contractility. In, in Ireland, as in the UK, and almost the same figures for the US, around 10% of births are preterm. And that, of course, is because the contractions start too early. As well as starting too early, contractions can actually be too strong. And so these are figures for the UK. Ten babies every day, born dead. And one of the causes of that is severe fetal distress. And that's because the uterus is contracting too strongly. I'll show that in more detail in a moment. So contractions too early, too strong, they can be too weak or too poor. After you've given birth to the baby, then the placenta, what you need is a strong contraction of the myometrium to stop the mother 
hemorrhage into death. And if that contraction isn't strong enough, that's exactly what can happen. So contractions can be too poor. They can also be too poor in labour. So this is when a labour goes to term and perhaps starts off well, but then the contractions are either too infrequent or too small in amplitude to do that work of labour that's needed. And then the only way to deliver the baby, if you have the facilities, is to do the unplanned or the emergency caesarean section. And just look at those numbers. Tens of thousands of women in the UK have this surgery. They didn't want it, they didn't ask for it, but that's what they have to have. Tens of thousands of women. And that ain't right. And that's because of poor contractility, which I'm going to call dysfunctional labour. And I say this, that we are actually still hopeless at predicting, preventing or treating these um, problems caused by aberrant uterine activity. So you may say, oh, come on, Sue, you're exaggerating. We know what you're like. So let's take that too poor to contract labour, the dysfunctional labour. We only have one drug. So imagine I'm standing here and I've got touch of heart failure. I've got heart failure. I go to the pharmacopoeia in the UK. There's at least 50 drugs you can give me to help my heart. Imagine I'm standing here giving birth. I'm very, very hardy. I'm giving birth. And I have one of these dysfunctional labours. What can you do for me? You can offer me one drug. And it's not really a drug. It's the hormone oxytocin. We've just got the one drug to help those women. And it works about 50% of the time. We can't usually tell in advance which women it's going to work on. Although, as I'll show you later on in the talk, we do now have a little bit of insight about why sometimes it might not work. So, in my dotage, I'm, I'm turning into the grumpy old woman and say, Rah, why is it that we don't seem to care as much about the organ that gives us life as we do about those that sustain it? In other words, if I wanted the funding, why don't I work on the brain or the heart? Sorry about that. So, and is it because, is it because, she said unsubtly, that this is seen as women's problem? Okay. So, what we're trying to do, of course, is therefore learn more about uterine activity so that we can have more births that are like Venus, just a froth from the ocean. That's what we want, isn't it? So, how can we do that? Let's study the myometrium. And this is to remind, ooh, remind you that um, I'm pretty fickle with species. Most of the time, I'll just willy-nilly change between humans and rats, the occasional mouse. Bottom line is, it doesn't actually matter. The fundamental elements are really similar. But I'll try and give the logo to keep things on schedule for what it is. One of the upsides of all those operations is that we can get human biopsies much more easily than if you were working on the brain or the heart. So there is an upside to it. And of course, what you can do is dissect that or you can digest down to the level of a single cell, which you can use for patch clamping, or as you've seen there, to load with indicator. These are still contractile and they respond um, and can give a change of calcium, for example. Or you can do traditional small or large scale organ bath studies to measure the parameters of contraction. You can do biochemical, pharmacological manipulations. Or you can also get uh, thin preparations and look at those on the confocal microscope if you're interested in the calcium signaling, as we often are. And I'll show that here. So this is a confocally uh, studied sheet of my meter, and you can see the individual cells and you'll see those light up when calcium rises and so what that's showing is that the activity can be altered and that changes the calcium signal and of course those calcium signals come because of changes in excitation this is a classic excitable tissue and so you need changes in electrical activity and those trains of action potentials given the calcium signal, which in turn governs the amount of force we get from the myometrium by and large. And many stimulants or relaxants work by altering this pathway. So this is the basic uh, 
physiology. And just to remind you that the uterus is a myogenic muscle. So that display there is not brought about by me electrically stimulating or giving a hormone. It is intrinsically rhythmic. Rhythmic, and so it will contract without nerves or hormones. You can alter the pattern with nerves and hormones, especially hormones, but basically this tissue, even down to the level of the single cell, is doing it for itself. So it is autorhythmic. I'm most interested in the A to Z, the electrical activity and the end product force, but of course for those more interested in what can often appear to us like a black box in smooth muscle of what's going on, particularly as all smooth muscles differ in this box. But here you can see, obviously, the, all the ion channels, receptors, there's oxytocin singled out, there's the psychoplasmic reticulum. But to remind those of you who study the bad muscles, the striated muscles, those of you who are not fellow travelers, that the calcium in smooth muscle binds to calmodulin. That activates myosin-like chain kinase. What does that kinase do? It phosphorylates the light chains of myosin. And in smooth muscle, it's only when the myosin is phosphorylated that you get significant interaction with actin and cross-bridge cycling. And therefore, you also need a phosphatase to dephosphorylate the myosin and promote a decrease in force or relaxation. So that is the difference between your smooth and your striated muscles. So let's move on to some data. And the first part is to persuade you that myometrial hypoxia is a normal part of labor. So you have there fetus, pink is the myometrium. And of course, to remind us that we've got the placenta. And it's the placenta and the umbilicals that connect to the fetus. And what you can see is that those blood vessels, of course, are present throughout the myometrium. So what's going to happen every time the myometrium contracts? And think how often that's going to happen in labor and how strong those contractions are. So now reminding you about fetal distress, I think you can easily imagine that if you have a complete clamp on those vessels. If the contraction is really strong, then you're going to not have adequate oxygenation to the fetus. It will become distressed. And clearly, if it goes on too long, death can ensue. So that's fetal distress. So every labor, though, of course, does have strong contractions. So we're going to have periods of compression and then the need for vasodilation of those blood vessels. So that led us to think, OK, is that actually enough, Sue, though, to influence the blood flow? Yes, the uterus contracts, but is it enough to functionally affect flow to the myometrium? So these are in vivo measurements. So this is uterine pressure you're looking at now, recorded in a rat. And what you can see, nice phasic contractions. And what you can see if you simultaneously measure blood flow during these normal contractions, there are the decreases in blood flow that are also occurring. So yes, that contractile activity is sufficient to affect the delivery of blood to the uterus. So in other words, we've got hypoxia. And hypoxia, as you well know, stimulates glycolysis and you'll get lactic acid production. Now we knew at the time that protons were deleterious to force in striated muscle. The story was much less well studied in smooth muscle, and indeed from vascular smooth muscle, there was evidence that acidification could be associated with an increase in force. So we decided to focus on this relationship at the level of pH. So that's going to be the focus of the studies we've done. So we asked the questions, does hypoxia in vivo, is it sufficient to affect pH? And more importantly, perhaps, does that actually happen, rather than being an um, ongoing effect from all those contractions, does it actually happen during a single contraction? And if the pH does change, can it affect the force production? So to address those questions, we used anesthetized pregnant rats, and we did the experiments in the bore of an NMR spectrometer. 
And this was back in the day when we weren't af afraid to say nuclear. These days, it's just MI. Back in the day, it was nuclear magnetic resonance. So in the bore of a spectrometer, a new <coughs> sorry, you prep the rat. It's such a shame for me. <laughs> Sore throat and cold, so there we go. Anyway, you prep the rat. It was more of a shame for the rat, I guess, actually, wasn't it? You prep the rat and uh, put an, uh, a catheter into the uterus so we can get pressure. NMR surface coil on top of the uterus so that we can get a measure, in this case, of intracellular pH within the myocytes. And then you locate the uterine vessels and you measure flow in those vessels. So we're doing that to address the question what happens during those contractions to intracellular pH? And what I did, or what we did, was to divide the contraction cycle up. So we have the equivalent of diastole, the rest period between contractions, force being developed, and force relaxing. So during that cycle, we now can look at what happens within the myocytes, that's where the signal's coming from, to intracellular pH. And what we saw was really I thought quite interesting that in vivo, during a single contraction, pH is falling. You've got a significant intracellular acidification, some recovery, but this rest period is clearly important for the restoration of intracellular pH. So I thought, that's really quite significant. During, this is in vivo work and changes during a single contraction. So what we've seen is that Blood flow decreases due to the contraction. Hypoxia, that decreases pH. So then the question becomes, well, what is it that's producing that decrease of pH? And not surprisingly, the culprit is lactate with stimulated anaerobic glycolysis. What I will say is that lactate within the myometrium is somewhat special in that close to term, you get gestational changes in the isoforms of lactate dehydrogenase. They change to be the form that works better under hypoxic or anaerobic conditions. Um, so the shifts in the isoforms. And what we showed was that lactate goes up during the contraction cycle. And if I poisoned the myometrium, if I blocked uh, glycolysis, um, oxidative phosphorylation, something like a tenfold increase in lactate. And if I stopped the efflux, the intracellular pH would decrease. So lactate, not surprisingly, is the culprit. So then the question moves on to be, well, actually, what does lactate do to contraction? Because that hadn't been studied. Can it affect the contraction or not? <coughs> Sorry. So this is work of a recent PhD student, Jackie Hanley, and what she showed in both women and rats was that there's a dose-dependent decrease in contractility the more lactate you give. And what she also showed is that even when you give, so those are spontaneous contractions, there's the lactate, there's a huge decrease in force. If you do it under a more physiological background of labour and have oxytocin there as a stimulus, so you can see the effects of oxytocin, lactate still decreases force. You can see the effect on frequency and amplitude, not as much as there, but overall you can still see when you look at the mean data, that in the physiological range of lactate levels, it decreases force. So certainly lactate decreases force. What is it about lactate that's decreasing force then? So as we know, lactate is a weak acid, so it made sense to think about pH. And what uh, Jackie did was use carboxysnarf, so a fluorescent indicator sensitive to pH, so these are in vitro measurements now, and what you can see when you put lactate on at different concentrations is you get progressively more acidification within the cells. So lactate decreases pH, does that explain why lactate decreases force, or is it other, perhaps more metabolic effects of lactate that are affecting force? So to answer that, what we did was to null that pH change. That's a weak acid. Let's give a weak base. In this case, ammonium chloride. When you do that simultaneously, you get no pH change. So let's add the lactate now without a pH change. And what are the effects 
of, on force. And what you can see quite clearly is that now you do not get the decrease in force. And that allowed us to conclude that these effects of lactate are almost exclusively due to its effects on pH. So as ever in physiology, well, that just gives rise to the next question, how? How is pH affecting force? So to do that, we've gone back to remembering this is an excitable tissue and we're getting quite marked effects on force. So let's measure membrane potential and force when we change pH. And we've used here not lactate, but another weak acid, butyrate. When you use butyrate, as I hope you can see, there's a hyperpolarization, no action potentials, no force. And it's only when we've recovered that you get your action potential trains and you get force. In addition, what we've shown at the level of a single cell when we patch clamp it is there's the normal robust inward current as that depolarization has opened L-type calcium channels. Calcium normally floods in. Under acidic conditions, that current is greatly reduced. And from that flows the fact that contractions are also reduced. So intracellular acidification reduces calcium and force within the myometrium. So we now seem to have a feedback loop that this bit we've seen already. We've now answered the question that a decrease of pH... Should I just stop and smile? <laughs> Sorry. It's not like you're putting me off at all. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that, and I'll hold my stomach in. <laughs> that you get a decrease of force. We've seen that. But of course, as the force decreases, as the record I uh, showed you earlier showed, pH starts to recover as blood flow starts to recover. So we reach normoxia again, setting up the conditions just right for the next train of action potentials and a powerful contraction. So we suggest that this could be protective. Come back to that thought about fetal distress and what is, I hope, clear is that you don't want the contraction to go on and on and on. So actually to have inherent within each myocyte this mechanism that is decreasing force at the peak is probably protective. So we have a protective feedback cycle. And with that, I'll just come to the conclusions <coughs> for this part of the talk. So I've shown you that blood vessels are repetitively, repeatedly compressed and then need to vasodilate during every labour. And that, that hypoxia, the changes in pH, those are a normal part of labour. It is normal. And that the intracellular acidification is due to lactic acid, and that in turn reduces contractility. And we have there a feedback cycle. So that's hypoxia just right. So what about hypoxia too much? So we have our cycle, but I'm sure you can see where I'm going to lead you now. What happens if after many cycles of compression, when either compressing more or we're not getting full vasodilation, that the blood flow doesn't always go back as far as it should, that pH is not as restored as much as it should be. And could this be set in the stage for a dysfunctional labour when the contractions don't go back to that but remain either infrequent or of low amplitude or incoordinate? And just because seeing is... Believing there's another example of acidification, this is in human myometrium, changing the pattern of activity to one which, if you were in labour here, you'd be happy. Everything's going well. But if you have this pattern, everything isn't going well. This is equivalent to a dysfunctional labour. That is not going to dilate the cervix. That is going to be a cause of those operative deliveries that we're trying to avoid the woman there doesn't look very keen on this, does it? I'm not against surgery. I'm not against <laughs> appropriate use of cesarean sections, but it's not always fun, is it, to have an operation? So the questions for this part of the talk is, could hypoxia be involved in dysfunctional labour? And, perhaps even more importantly, is there any way we can translate these findings to improve labour outcomes? So to just give you a few um, sorry. 
And to just say how we did this with clinical colleagues, lots of caesarean sections, as soon as you put the knife in, get a blood sample, myometrial capillary blood, get blood samples. Of course, get them analysed on the blood gas machine. And then separately and independently, after we've got all the data, two obstetricians categorised those labours. Those women having elective caesarean sections, clearly not in labour. Two groups of women who were in labour and had or didn't have oxytocin. These were perhaps women who had fetal distress or undiagnosed uh, breach position. But the group I'm most interested in is this group who were having the poor contractions, the dysfunctional labour, and because it's protocol, they're all given oxytocin. So then we've got the blood samples. What actually happens to the state of that blood that until moments ago was bathed in the myometrial bundles, the contractile environment? So what you can see is in the, these first three, there's not really much difference in the pH of that myometrial blood, in the dysfunctionally labouring group, a really clear, these aren't even huge N numbers, a really clear, significant decrease in the pH of that blood. So that was surrounding the myometrium, as I say, just moments earlier, and it's significantly more acid. And I'm labouring, ho-ho, this point a little bit, because this was actually, even if you're thinking there and say, well, so what? This was actually the first insight as to why some women would be labouring dysfunctionally. Before this, you would just say, oh, it's one of those things. Yeah, we don't know if you're going to get it or you're going. It's one of those things. We can't do anything about it other than give you oxytocin and a cesarean section. This is the first insight into the physiology or the pathophysiology, if you prefer, of what might be going on, that there's something causing a fall of pH and that something is, again, um, lactate, because we were able to show that lactate was also doubled in that myometrial capillary blood sample. So lactate is increased. So then, I th was a few years later, and I saw this on our BBC Health News, a test which could predict the need for caesarean section, and that obviously piqued my interest. And at this stage, I want to introduce a really smart woman, Eva Witzberg Itzel. We're now collaborators. But at the time, what she did was join those dots that I didn't join up. You have these women labouring dysfunctionally, and there's more acid, if you will, in their myometrial blood. Some of that is going to get into the amniotic fluid. So what Eva did was collect that and measure it in a whole range of women at the start of their labours. And then she had a range of values which she could then categorise as normal or high lactate in the amniotic fluid. This wasn't um, an invasive uh, measurement. This was just some of that amniotic fluid that, again, those of you who have been there and done that, is trickling out around the time at the start of labour. And what Eva showed in her paper was that lactate in the normal range, that was going to probably be a good outcome in terms of not needing surgery. However, if the lactate was high, there was a greatly increased risk that you were going to need the operative delivery. And perhaps now what this is saying is that, along with our data, if lactate is high in the myometrium, oxytocin probably isn't going to do a very good job of stimulating the uterus. And what I usually say is it's a bit like flogging the dead horse, isn't it? It's not really going to do much. And indeed, as I say, we've gone on to collaborate. It probably isn't doing much good for the fetus either. And again, there is a correlation there between adverse neonatal outcomes and having the high amniotic fluid lactate. Well, that's sort of fine, isn't it? But who wants a test that says, hey, you know what, you're going to have a really rotten time in labour and there's probably not a lot we can do about it. Can we, um, can we do anything about it? So to put one's money where one's mouth is, we're saying that pH is important, is a cause of some dysfunctional labours. So can we then get rid of the pH change? So I've introduced you to the idea of a pH nulling experiment with Jackie's work and the ammonium chloride. Ammonium chloride is not very palatable, so we're not going to go down that road. But palatable 
is what bicarbonate it is when it's given as effervescent tablets or powders. It's an antacid. I'm sure probably everyone at this room at some stage has had alka seltzer or an antacid. Hangover cures, maybe some of you had it this morning. This is largely bicarbonate, but made palatable. And so this was the um, Swedish form of getting that bicarbonate, something that women will have been buying anyway if they've had some gastric upsetting pregnancy, but over the counter, readily available throughout, very familiar to women in labour. And do a small randomised control trial. So all the women had to be in their first pregnancy and there had to be that clinical diagnosis of a dysfunctional labour. And so then, randomised. One envelope would say, you have the standard treatment and that's bring on the oxytocin. The other set of envelopes would say, have that effervescent drink. Take five, ten minutes to drink it. You'll be getting around <coughs> four or five grams of bicarbonate. And then after an hour, bring on the standard treatment. Give them oxytocin. And then let's monitor labour outcome. So when this was done, perhaps, as you would expect, little change in pH in the women with no treatment, but a slight rise of pH in the group that had the bicarbonate. The fetuses actually also had um, improved metabolic um, consequences, a rise in fetal pH. But the thing we're interested in, what about need for operative delivery? How many women were able to have a spontaneous vaginal delivery? And they're really excited by this outcome a significantly increased number of women avoided surgery and could have vaginal delivery. And I think this is just amazing. When you think this is the simplest of starts, isn't it? Because we've not tailored that dose of bicarbonate to body weight. We've not tailored it to how, um, how much lactate was there or whatever other parameter you want. And we've not given repeated doses of it. So I think this is really exciting. But what excites me even more, I think, is what this could do going back to developing world countries where women don't necessarily even have the chance of having that caesarean section or if they do, it's really risky. This is as cheap as chips. You can get this for pence. You can just have it on the shelf. You don't need refrigeration for those sachets or tablets of bicarbonate. And you don't need skilled medical staff to say, just drink this down it's really, really could have a lot of impact on that. I'll share with you, our MRC has just had a, a slug of money for doing research for low and middle income countries. I put the study in and I found out two days ago, sorry, it's not high enough priority. Great. So it's not going to be funded by our MRC. We'll find other ways to do it. But that just comes down to some of the frustrations. And I was talking to Rachel earlier in this field we study from. So, hey, you know, I'm no longer the grumpy woman because there are, there is going to be, I'm going to make it happen, two drugs possibly that can help. Of course, there are other approaches and we need our basic science to bring on new discoveries and new drugs. Rachel, for example, is working on the use of potassium channel modulation uh, for preterm delivery. A postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Sarah Arrowsmith, were working with chemists and other scientists to develop new basic science approaches to new drugs, antagonism, agonists within these sectors. So there will be more, but it's painfully slow work. Again, though, we come back to why. Great, Sue, you know, you've now moved us on. We can do something to help those women cut down the surgery, but it still doesn't get to the fundamental, does it? Why? Why are some women suffering from this and not all women if it's this fundamental mechanism. And really what I can say about the causes of dysfunctional labours are pretty limited. There's some weak genetic association, a component. Obesity is a risk factor. We know that. We've shown obese women contract more poorly, actually, um, in vivo and in vitro. But otherwise, it's pretty unknown. And we were interested in, and I've not got really much data here to show you, but in the lab, um, could it be that the blood vessels that have to undergo these repetitive periods of contraction and relaxation, could that be a key to it? So work from Claude Prendergast in the lab 
So there's the biopsy. And what she does is not, not dissect out the fibres, but dissect out the vessels. So heroic work that I can assure you I could not do. But what you can see is once you get those human vessels, that you can get robust contraction. And then there, acetylcholine, in the form of carbocal, relaxes the vessels. And we want to do this repetitively. But what Claude has also found is that some of them don't. So here you've got a video that doesn't show very much at all because this is Clodagh applying the carbocol, applying the carbocol, and it is not relaxing, even at pretty heroic concentrations. She now gives bradykinin, and you can see those endothelial cells lighting up. Calcium is rising in them. So it's not that we've damaged the endothelium. In some women, for some reason, they are not adequately dilating to acetylcholine. And so perhaps this could be a fruitful uh, plow to uh, to field to plough, but we're not doing, uh, we've only just started on that, that journey. So what I've shown you, lactate reduces my metal pH, acid reduces excitability, uh, calcium transients and contractions, and that labouring dysfunctionally is associated with lactic acidosis, that if that comes through in the amniotic fluid, it's a predictor and that we have this exciting data showing that bicarbonate may be useful to overcome. And perhaps, intrinsically, once we know a little bit more about the mechanisms, perhaps we can get biomarkers and do something earlier on to avoid it. I said that was the long section. It is a briefer section, I promise you, is hypoxia. And I want to now convince you that hypoxia isn't necessarily the enemy and introduce the idea of hypoxia-induced force increase, which does sound a bit crazy, I'll grant you, but I hope to um, carry you with me into this. So, of course, we evolved in an oxygen-rich environment, but there are periods of hypoxia, and we've heard talks here about women um, in um, giving birth or being pregnant at high altitude and animals and what that can do. But cells have evolved strategies to cope with this, organisms have as well. One of the interesting adaptations is, was first shown in cardiac muscle. And that's where if you, it's called hypoxic preconditioning. And if you give brief but repeated small hypoxic or ischemic episodes, then what that does is protect the heart from subsequent more severe, more prolonged insults. So the hypoxia producing some change that is beneficial to surviving a larger heart attack. So that, of course, gets me thinking, well, hey, hang on a minute. In labour, we also have transient repetitive episodes of ischemia and hypoxia. And that's a normal part of labour. So could it be, could it be that this hypoxia is actually part of the mechanism of labour? Which I grant you is a, clearly a crazy thought, but we have some evidence for that. So what I've shown you so far is gets us back to a steady state of contraction in that cycle, but it doesn't explain, does it, how the contractions get larger, which is of course what we need for labour and delivery. So you're going to say, oh, it's obviously it's oxytocin. Yes, oxytocin plays a part in this, but mice with their oxytocin receptor knocked out, women who lack oxytocin, they give birth normally. So oxytocin isn't the only thing. And when you think about it, something as fundamental as labour and delivery, there's going to be more than one cause. And what I'm suggesting is that inherent in the myometrium is hypoxia as part of that labour mechanism. So is hypoxia playing a role in labour? So this is showing you spontaneous contractions from a rat. And what you can see, they go on very steadily for ages. Let's now give some hypoxia. So this is not anoxia. This is dropping the PO2 down to 3 or 2%. And as you would expect now, since these were paired recordings, what you'd expect, force falls. You go back to normoxia, force recovers. But what we saw many times was that there was a slight increase. But let's do the hypoxia again, decrease, recovery, but recovery to a higher amount. And when we did this when Mohammed, another PhD student in the lab last year, what we saw was this sustained increase in contractility. Now I'll tell you for free, it's really easy getting students giving you data where force falls. 
hey, hey, you know, we can get that any day of the week, more or less. To have a student come to you with, look at this, look at this, it's increasing, is pretty startling. And so obviously, checked it, as you would hope. That's the data you've just seen. I'll show you two, and we've called it hypoxia-induced force increase. I'll tell you, show you two experiments where it didn't work. So there you've done the same protocol of the hypoxia doesn't work. The top one is from a non-pregnant rat. We don't get it. And the bottom one, even more interestingly, is quite a close to term rat, but it's only 18 days. This would go another one or two days before going into labor. So this mechanism, this powerful mechanism, is only there, if you will, when you need it in close to labor. So that you wouldn't want the mechanism coming earlier. It might be a cause of preterm delivery. So we also showed that we got it in the presence of oxytocin. So you can see here, spontaneous contractions stimulate very nicely with oxytocin, do the protocol, and we still get it. So it's at least synergistic with oxytocin. So we still get it even in the presence of oxytocin. And uh, we get it in women in labor, but not women who aren't laboring. And the mechanism, again, going to be multifactorial. Something like hypoxia is going to be affecting many stages of signaling. And in times of um, oxidative stress, cells lose both adenosine and ATP, which then feed back on the um, extracellular receptors there. Both of those seem to be involved, as do prostaglandins, because if we give a COX-2 inhibitor, again, we don't see it, or we see a lot less of it. So coming back to those signaling pathways, those are our suggestions. It probably is also that extracellular pH may be playing a role there to promote this. That's ongoing work in the lab. So that, I hope, has persuaded you to some extent that hypoxia, as well as being a normal part of labor, is actually perhaps a vital part of normal labor. But hey, Sue, those have all been in vitro experiments. What about some in vivo work? And at first I said, yeah, but that would be so difficult. How do we do that? And then you have one of those moments. Oh, my goodness. Ten years ago, Sue, what were you doing? You were doing the in vivo work, but a different set of experiments. And this was the work that we published. And what we saw was, so this was a slightly different protocol get the blood supply, but now have reversible occluders on that blood supply. So we could look at the effects of longer-term occlusion. And what we saw was that. That's the mean data. And those were actually because even back then I was interested in repetitive activity. And you can see in vivo now more activity after those hypoxia. And of course, in the paper, do you think I mentioned that force was increased? Did I heckers like? I just said force recovers because I had no idea. And you think, oh, maybe something moved or it's a measurement. Now I'm saying to you, hey, look how smart we were. This is in vivo evidence. The hippie, serendipity, the, et cetera, the favored mind. Yeah. OK, so that was part three, um, showing that. So really now all that is needed is for me to sum up. I've got two conclusion slides. The first is, Hypoxia, like Goldilocks, you can get it just right, and now I'm going to say that's hippy. Too much, perhaps dysfunctional labour, and too early, perhaps preterm labour. And we have to get that balance right. Second conclusion is, for sure, we need better futures for this. There are still many fundamental questions that remain. That's my granddaughter, Anna, already being brought up in a good scientific tradition, but I chose her rather than a grandson to say what we also need is more women in science and not to lose women from science. If we're going to have a trained and good workforce, we need to have both of the genders pulling their weight here. So more women. And we have to get on with this. We have to get on with this because women are dying. As I've given this talk, goodness knows how many women have died. So we need to make every mother and child count. And just to thank the great team in the lab who've helped bring this work to you. And I like this African expression, to go fast, go alone, to go far, take others with you. And I hope I've taken you with me. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>